the book of Matthew this morning. And while you're turning there, I, I just wanted to give you a little update. Y'all got off talking about gospel and southern gospel and gospel this, and we talk about the gospel and preaching the gospel. I'm always amazed how many folks don't really know there are unique points to what the gospel is. The gospel is the fact that God keeps his word. Everything that God said he would do, he fulfilled and did in and through Jesus the Christ. He was uniquely at work in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What they, they sang up here, this would mean nothing. You know, if Christ is not raised, our hope is what? In vain. And so that unique work of God in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus gives us the sense that Death has been overcome. He's got victory over sin, death, and the grave. And so that's a great truth. He was then exalted to the right hand of God the Father. Folks, that means he's God. And he sat down because his work of redemption was finished. There's nothing else you have to do. There's nothing else I have to do. God has done all we need done in and through Jesus Christ. And as a result, as God always does, he keeps his word. You remember what Jesus said? If I go to the Father, I'll send another. In the Greek, it says, of the exact same essence as me. And he will be with you, and he will lead you in all manners of truth. And the first piece of truth that most of us need to hear from God is that we are sinners, hopelessly and helplessly lost, without what God in Christ has done for us. And folks, that's the gospel. And when we hear that, then we must respond. And when we respond, then we're either saved or lost based on that. That is the gospel. Those are the six points of the kerygma. Now, that's a very important piece of literature in the New Testament. But then when we come to this piece, we find another, which is dedicate or teaching material. And we've been looking at its purest form in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. And we refer to that as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, let me tell you that Matthew organized his gospel in five pieces. In fact, I want you to kind of go to the end of the text today and read how you can know he did this. So go to verse 28 of chapter 7, and we'll start at the end and then go back to the beginning of the text and come through. But I want you to read what he says. This is when Jesus had finished saying these things. Now, if you go to 11.1, if you go to 13.53, if you go to 9.1, you'll find those exact same wor words because he wrote his gospel in five deliberate blocks of material. It has an introduction or an epilogue and a conclusion and or a prologue, whichever you want to use. And so that's how he put the book together. So we're right in the middle of... Uh, we're not in the middle. We're right at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a teaching that uh, that seventh chapter speaks to directly about judgment. Now, one of the most misinterpreted topics in all of Christian literature, one known and misquoted by most of the unbelieving world, is, you know, the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. I'm going to tell you what, that is not what the Bible says. You say, well, pastor, I read it. It says right here, judge not lest ye be judged. Yes, that is what it says, but what it means by that is, don't you have a harsh, false judgment of others, and don't you dare step in the direction of judgment until you have addressed self-judgment. So last week, we looked at the first consideration in chapter 7, and that was judging yourself. You are to remove the splinter from your brother's eye, but you can't do that till you get the saw log out of your own. Most of us would be far more effective in helping others with difficulties in their life if we'd get our own act straight. You know, so you got to start there, and they at least have to see you working on that. You know, I always tell people, they, they, they'll they come up and they say, well, pastor, is it a sin, or if they're really passionate about it, am I going to go to hell, you know, if I don't stop smoking? And I said, no. There's only one sin that you can commit that would send you to hell, and that's to never put your faith and trust in Christ. 
but I'm going to really get on to you about that smoking as soon as I lose my weight. <laughs> you know, you know I, I remember being in an early uh, message, and a guy was preaching to a bunch of preachers, and he says, how in the world can you stand in the pulpit and preach about sin when it's hanging all over you? It brings some conviction. Some of y'all, like me, need to be convicted. I want you to know I walked five days last week. I got my two new 50-pound dumbbells, and I'm back at it. So you better get with it, because as soon as I lose it, I'm coming after you. Okay. <laughs> oh, gee. You know, judgment is a unique thing. Last week, we looked about the need to put judgment of self first, because, you see, that gives you clarity, and it aligns you with God. And then it gives you certainty in that clarity with the right spirit to help someone else. And so today, we come to the second section of these three considerations on judgment. And this one, of course, has to do with judging others. Now, we begin in chapter 7 and in verse 6. Now, I affectionately call the first point and the first Subpoint: dogs, pigs, and wolves. Doesn't that sound good? Dogs, pigs, and wolves. It talks about them in here. Uh, so let's begin reading there in verse 6 of chapter 7. It says, Do not give dogs what is sacred. This is holy things. You know, we live in a world where we don't treat anything as sacred and holy. This book, folks, is sacred. The cover, the pages, the words, ink, paper, leather. What makes it sacred is what it says. And what really makes it sacred is when you and I, as the living epistles of God, live what it says. How much of the world would come to Jesus? How much of the world would respond to this truth if God's people would simply focus on living it? And we don't have a right to be in judgment of others, you see, until in our judgment of ourselves we pick up that mind and heart and spirit of Christ. In fact, the key passage is found in verse 12. I think you might have heard of it. You may even call it the golden rule, and it says this, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, you know, our gospel singer this morning helped us walk past Buddha and Mohammed and any other tradition where that person lived and died but I would tell you, if you begin to look into the lessons of Confucius and Mohammed and, and Buddha, and the, these people were striving for a truth. In fact, most every one of them had some representative of this particular truth that we're just reading. It's Jesus who not only made it positive, but he made it possible. He made it possible. And you have to do that by learning to live the truth. That's why this series is entitled The Living Word. You and I are God's representatives of the living word. When he gets in you and lives in and through you, it begins to affect all of those around you. And that's what we're after as believers. That's what we should be after. And so if we're going to judge others, then we must first be discerning. So he says... Do not give what is sacred or holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls to pigs. Now, you're going to love this word. How many of you like Mexican? How many of you lie and you won't tell me? Okay, if you like Mexican and you go into a, a store uh, where they serve that food, they usually always have some kind of a reader board out front, and they tell you what the specials are. Now, I know all good badges look below the first one, and we read what the offerings are, but usually there's a margarita <laughs> right there. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is that's the Greek word 
score like English P. And a P is about the size of a pearl. All right? And when the pig thinks that what you threw in front of him is a P, and he bites on it and he finds out it's a pearl, he's going to get agitated. And I use the word disgruntled. You say, well, Pastor, how do you know that? Read with me. He says, don't cast your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. You ever expect to get one thing and get another? You went wanting to receive something and the person gave you something totally different? Oh, I'm telling you. You go through McDonald's, Burger King, Arby's, Chick-fil-A. I don't care which one of them you drive through. And, you know, you never realize till you're already out of the line, headed down the road, they gave you somebody else's stuff. I mean, you've got your mind set on that delicious piece of chicken between the bread there. And you find out they gave you a salad. (laughs) No, this can't be. And worse than that, you can't eat it because you're driving. It just irritates you when you lay it in the seat. You know? Well, you know, all that making fun is that, you know, when we learn to practice discretion, we learn to not give something that is precious. Now, this is when you need to keep your mouth shut. Don't give something that is precious to you to someone who's going to treat it with no discretion. You know, know, be sure that you pay attention to what is given to you because if you get it and walk off with it, you may end up disgruntled just like the pig. And even worse than a dog or a pig, go over to uh, verse 15, it says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They look like, sound like, walk like, smell like the real thing, but underneath there is a deception, and they're out to fleece the sheep. Be careful. Practice discretion. Because you see, God has given you what he has given you. It's a precious treasure, even if he's given it to you in an earthly vessel. And so he says, be careful. Be very, very careful. In John 6 and verse 30, we have just finished a a section there where Jesus has fed the 5,000. And then he sent them away. And you remember he sent the disciples across the water. And he went up into the mountains to pray. And and it got time for him to get over there to where the disciples were. And he did what? Kind of like my opening. He was walking on the water. I know some of y'all won't get it till now. But he was walking on the water. Just like the old man. You know, he never had any idea that uh, you had to be spiritual to be able to walk on water. He just wanted to know how to say amen. And and so, uh, you know, Jesus walks on the water and he gets over to the other side and they discover that he has evaded them. And so they make their way around the Sea of Galilee. Now, you got to remember the Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles by 7 miles. It's not huge. Uh, and, uh, And so they make their way over to where Jesus is and he begins this time not to feed them but to teach them about the bread of life. Now, when that occurs, they're disappointed. And sometimes we find disappointment something we can't stand. But if we would just practice discernment, we wouldn't get ourselves in that place. So don't be like the dogs, don't be like the pigs, and don't be like the wolves, but be sure you pay attention to them and learn from them. That's what Jesus is saying. And then he moves into what we need to do. We need to do this, pay attention, because we don't want to end up being partakers of perverse products. Now, 
that's a stretch to get it alliterated. But, you know, if you really go back and look up perverse, uh, have you ever got a piece of bad food? Ugh. You know, I, I mean, I, I was one of those folks who said I've never met a food I didn't like. And I was in college, and my next-door neighbor said, I have something for you to taste, Craig. And I said, well, what is that? He says, this is a black, dried, imported olive from the Holy Land. Well, I opened it up. Well, I should have known better when I opened it up. But I thought, well, I've never had a dried black olive. And I'm telling you, I like to have never got that down. And I promise you I never wanted another one after I ate it. Uh, you know, it, it just wasn't what it said it would be, and it tasted awful. And so he says, be sure that you make observations when you are in the midst of discerning. You wouldn't go and see a thorn bush and think that you're going to get a grape. And you wouldn't go and see a thistle and think you're going to get a fig. You know, and if you and I can be that discerning just about the normal things, then with the Spirit of God, we can be much more discerning about everything. And so, he runs through this second section in verses 16 through 19. And I want you to go there with me because they tie in here. He says, by their fruit you will recognize or know them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will know them. Well, that sounds biblical, doesn't it? But what's he talking about? Let me help you as Paul interprets for you a little bit about fruit inspection. Go with me to the book of Galatians. If you'll go there and find chapter 5, Paul speaks about two different kinds of fruit. He talks about the fruit is the fruit that's of the flesh, and he talks about the fruit that is the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to the fruit of the flesh and see if you've shopped there sometime. He says the fruit of the flesh or the acts of the flesh. He, he, you know, he's kind of, I don't know if he's being arrogant, but he says it, it's obvious. It ought, it ought to be something that you recognize. And if you recognize it, then you're making what? A judgment. You're, you're not taking something precious and good and dismissing it to do something bad. It ought to be obvious to you, and you know that because when you look, it's on a thorn bush and a thistle. It's not hanging from a grapevine or a fig tree. And so he says this. This is what you see. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, Paul says, as I did before, that those who live like this. Now, if you are living like this, or you know someone who is living like this, the Bible is very clear about that. There's no inheritance in the kingdom for that. But now, if you want to eat stuff that looks good, smells good, tastes good, and is good, then look at these. These are the fruits of the Spirit. Love. Are you characterized by seeking the highest good of others, even if it's sacrificial on your part? Joy. You know, have you ever been around a person who was going through terrible circumstances and difficulties, and yet they seem to embody and carry this sense of peace and certainty. That's what peace is. It's internal at restness in the midst of adverse circumstances. Love, joy, peace. How about a little of this fruit? How about kindness? 
You know, a kind word turns away what? Wrath. How about goodness? People who just, you like to be around them and you watch them and, and they are just good people. You know that. In fact, Paul says what? It's obvious. Goodness, faithfulness. Oh, man, we need a world. I mean, speaking to our millennials, speaking to our young adults, uh, speaking to some of our older adults who have found bad ways like them, do what you say you're going to do. Show up. Don't leave people wondering until you're there if you're going to be there. And live in such a way that people know they can rely on your character and your behavior. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Oh, you know, we start acting right and doing right, and we think that we're more right than others. And we communicate that with an air of superiority. I think Jesus used a word about that hypocrite. Hmm. Got to go back and work on that saw log some more, don't we? Gentleness and self-control. There is, I, 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 tell, I tell my boys, and I guess because I had it drilled into me, listen to me, people, there's never a right reason to do a wrong thing. There's never a right reason to do a wrong thing. And you can only do that when you allow the Holy Spirit of God to control you. I know what it is to want to slap someone naked. Y'all ever say that? We said that in Alabama. You know, it just, I, I just want to stomp them and uh, I give them a piece of my mind. And that maybe was wrong with me. I've given away too much of it. Some of you are suffering. And, you know, these are the different expressions we have. But, you know, there's never a reason to be out of control. Never, ever. God's word is true and it doesn't lie. Go to this place and pick your fruit and eat it and you will be healthy. Well, so, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, that, we've said it so much that it gets wrapped up in what I call God talk. And it sounds right, and we know it comes from the Bible, but let, let me make an attempt at what it says. When you look at someone, and you really want to jump their case, you really want to slam dunk them, you just use any expression that you use, try to put yourself in their position, and then get the treatment that if that was you, you would want. I make mistakes. I do things I'm not supposed to do. I mean, I'm driving down the road sometimes and I think, oh, I hope they don't know that I'm the preacher. <laughs> you know, that's where preachers get their rage at is on the road. <laughs> I mean, God saved me. Somebody brought me one of those little fans with a smiley face on one side and a frown on the other. And I was going down the road right over here on uh, 15th Street right there at St. Andrews where you come around that curve. And this guy that I had, I mean, I just as smoothly went right in front of him. He did not like it. And he pulled out in his big old black truck in the turn lane and pulled right up beside me and just sat down on his horn. And I took that fan out. And <laughs> but that kept me from taking anything else out or saying anything else, see? So, I mean, it was kind of like twice blessed. You know, Folks, you know, all these, this humor, all this, it, it's, it's not just what we know. It's what we do. You see, you can know, and in fact, the Greeks were real conscious of this. You can have data and knowledge. You can have gnosis. That's the Greek word, and we get what? Our word knowledge from that. But the know here, the recognize here, is not the word gnosis, it's the word gnosko. And that means that you know and understand and operate out of sensibleness that has come as a result of experience. 
know, there's a difference between knowing and knowing, isn't it? And so he says, you know what to do, do it. Isn't that what James says? Be ye what? Doers of the word and not just hearers only. And we're so guilty of it, church. We show up, we listen, we go through the truths of Scripture. We know it, but we don't leave here and do it. And that's what God wants us to do. And so he says, be sure you don't end up with a perverse product. The conclusion, of course, is by their fruits, you will recognize them. So when they see you, are you more in that first list or that second list? And worse yet, if you're in the first list, do you justify being there? Oh, church, we need to make some change. We need to have the Holy Spirit of God come and remove the sin and iniquity from our own life and replace it with his love and his strength and his sacrifice and his goodness and his gentleness and his love and his joy and his peace, his patience, all those things. And I'll tell you what, when you do that, your life will be marvelously better. You know, when you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't cheat, you don't commit adultery, you don't bear false witness, you're not covetous. When you put God first and you keep his day holy and you make it uniquely his and you don't put anything in front of them, your life is far, far better. And one day, maybe the light will come on and you'll realize all God wants for us, his creature, as the creator, is our best. In fact, I know you've probably never done this, My spirit probably was not right. Well, no, my my spirit was not right. But somebody I had given some advice to, and they went in the complete other direction, and they came back, and they were talking about how, and I I asked them, well, how's that working for you? No wonder how many times God feels that way when he looks at the way you and I live. And he just simply says, how's that working for you? Well, be inquiring, because we know inquiring minds want to know, right? I thought somebody would get that. There is a method of seeking this discriminating type of behavior. It's a present tense, so it sounds more like this, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Because if you ask and keep on asking, it'll be given to you again and again and again. And if you seek and keep on seeking, you will find again and again and again. And if you knock and keep on knocking, oops, have stopped there. Tense changes. Tense changes. Because if you're knocking at the door of God's heart in heaven, what he promises you is one day it moves to the future tense, and that door will open. Now, folks, we're on a journey. God's given us a way to bless us along the way so that one day there is an eternal result of your choice and how you encourage others to choose when you're making healthy, godly judgments. So, with that, he says the method demands a motive. The motive means that your heart's got to be like that. He said, well, now you've been evil and He didn't miss any of us. He's talking to all of us. We all have that Adamic nature. We all have that twisted uh, peace that makes us do wrong when we know we ought to do right. And, And on and on we could qualify all of that. And he says, but if you being evil can give your children good things, in other words, if your daughter, you're sitting there with your arm wrapped around your daughter this morning and she's loving it, yeah, and you did good in the children's time. I appreciate you helping me out. Uh, if she came and wanted some bread, would you give her a stone? 
It might look like a piece of bread. Well, most parents wouldn't because they'd probably bite into it and break their teeth and then we'd have to pay for it. But, but you know, no, you wouldn't give them a stone. And if they asked you for a fish, would you give them a snake? And see, in the Sea of Galilee, they've got a snake that looks a lot like one of their fishes. So Jesus is speaking to something that is common in the mind of the hearer. And he says in that uh, question, which is rhetorical, certainly not. You wouldn't do that. And if you being evil would do that, how much more does God want to give you good things? And his heart is perfect and true. Oh, friend, I'm going to tell you, the reason every one of you, if you don't know Christ, ought to come to Christ is because he has the best for you. He wants the greatest life for you. In fact, he said that if you come to him out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. An artesian well will spout out from under you. In fact, you'll have life overflowing. Oh, God wants so much for us folks if we would just honor him with our lives. So that moves us into how are you navigating your life? You know, you, you can choose a lot of different paths. In fact, Jesus says... There's really just two. There's a broad way. That's the way everybody else is going. Do you ever make your decisions based on a kind of a mental tally you take in your mind about who's doing what and how many? Well, everybody's doing that. Well, you know, i got to change this because, you know, it's just not politically correct anymore because everybody's doing this. Oh, and let's get to the one that's theological church, the one that we're having trouble with today. Is there another way to salvation other than Jesus Christ? Yeah, well, some of us more emphatic. Just always be, I always tell my emphatic folks, temper that with love. And if you're not emphatic, then my question is, why not? I mean, if, if you're putting any value in what God has said he said I am that's him speaking as God just like he did in the burning bush in the book of Exodus when he spoke to Moses I am Jesus said I am the way not a way I am the way I am the truth yes truth is absolute God is truth I'm the way, I'm the truth, and what you get is life. I am the life. And if anyone comes, you know, all these people and all these religions are seeking the same things. They're seeking right relationship as a fallen creature with their creator. And he says, I am the life. You can't get it any other way. And that's not popular. People will call you a bigot. They'll call you intolerant. They'll call, but folks, their eternal destiny is at stake. And we've got to give them the truth, which is the good news of God in Christ Jesus, because it's the only way. And so there's a broad way, and the end thereof is destruction. Did your mama know that? My mother knew that. Well, mama, I want to do this. And my mother would say, no. And I'd say, mother, why? And she'd say, if everybody sticks their head to fire, you going to stick yours in there too? I didn't want to hear that. But you know, because everybody else is doing it, it's not a good reason for you to do it. In fact, he said, narrow is the way. And I know in this older group, is anybody in their Bible got straight is the way? See, old King James says straight is the way. Now, I, you know, I just read right over that. And I looked at straight as like, you know, uh, it's almost time to go. It's 10 minutes to 12. I see Barry standing at the back door. He's waiting on invitation. It's a straight shot for him to come from there to here and lead you, and a straight shot for me to go from here to there and let you out. 
And that's what I understood about straight. But it's the same sound but a different spelling. It means press. It's a passage between rocks like a straight. And he says, the way that leads to life is compressed. It's difficult. And so straight is the way. And narrow, straight, pressed. You know, life, real life, is filled with opposition and obstacle and difficulty. And things that depress us. And boy, as a culture, we... You know, we are eat up with that. In fact, it's so much, they say that the common code of mental disorder is depression. And how many folks are on antidepressants and drugs because of depression? And if your doctors put you there, you stay on that. You get straight, but I'm just telling you, it's an epidemic in our culture. But God wants us to find the way because on the other side of that pressed and difficult life, when we use the sensible guidelines and judgment making that he places in front of us about ourselves and about others, leads to life everlasting. There's something born out of the crucible. And I learned it early in my life. You can take cast iron, heat it to the point of melting, Keep it there for a prescribed amount of time. Take it out, and it transforms from cast iron into ductile. And you can take a hammer and beat on it all day, and you can't break it. I don't tell you what, you can go a step further. If you take that same material, you heat it even hotter, and you get it hot enough up into the multiple digits of degrees, 23, 24,000 degrees, and not only do you get beyond cast iron, not only do you get beyond ductile, you get to steel. And if you heat it harder than that, you can get to stainless steel. And every level gives a stronger substance with more flexibility in it. You see, that's what God wants. That's what he wants for you, he wants for me. He wants us to know, but he wants us to do what we know. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What, what is it? He's talking about a situation where you're making a judgment. And so when you make that judgment, make it as though you were them. Aren't you glad God loved us that way? God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet rebellious, sinful, and against him, Christ died for the ungodly. When was the last time you gave yourself up for somebody that was doing something wrong to you? Because you wanted to act like God does. You know, they could have said a lot of things in the first century about the winsomeness of Christianity. But this is what the pagan community registered in the annals of history. Behold how they love one another. Is that the characteristic that epitomizes your behavior and mine? If we're going to judge others properly, it must be. Let me encourage you this morning. Let the Holy Spirit help you take a good look at yourself. Because you see, God desperately needs workers in the kingdom to help others who won't. The world needs the church. But the church needs to be Christ-like. Pray with me. Father, today, thank you for your word.